AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota, Brett Johnson, with you here on a Tuesday afternoon. And today we are joined by the editor-in-chief of the Minnesota Reformer. That's Patrick Hulican, who joins us to talk about some of the stories and columns that they have been working on over the past few days. As today we are going to be talking about a new Republican candidate in the 2nd Congressional District that looks to be challenging DFLer Angie Craig. Plus, we will be talking about something from Christopher Ingram that he wrote, talking about some of the some score issues with schools in Minnesota and especially with charter schools that are oftentimes struggling when compared to public schools. So we'll be getting into both of those topics for today. As always, Patrick, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So let's start off talking about what's happening over in the 2nd Congressional District because Joe Tirab is going to be running against Angie Craig in the 2nd Congressional District. Tirab is a Republican, and on paper he has a very strong resume. He's a Harvard Law grad, a Marine Corps veteran, and former county and federal prosecutor, as well as being a son of a Sudanese immigrant. But in your column, you make the argument that despite these credentials, he's still pretty much on board with re-electing Donald Trump. And that really became official after his Republican opponent for the nomination, Tyler Rahm, challenged Tirab on his Trump loyalty. And on his website, uh, you also noted this on Tirab's website, he also said, quote, I will always support law enforcement and ensure that criminals are held accountable, unquote, which is uh, pretty rich considering Donald Trump's attacks on the Department of Justice and the FBI. So this guy, Tirab, definitely on board with endorsing Trump, but to me, in essence, this seems like a guy who will be throwing away what seems like a pretty strong resume to, well, bow to Donald Trump again, like so many other Republicans do. And you wonder how successful this could be in a place like CD, too. Yeah, um, I think this if you're a Republican uh, who is interested in, in taking this seat, this is a, a pretty unfortunate development um, because the kind of Republican you need to win there is uh, is probably going to be uh, somebody who, who is more uh bipartisan um there has that disp- uh, disposition and uh is not going to just fall in line um with uh with the party line and especially with with Trump's line uh as you mentioned he has a real strong resume on paper he's been a, a prosecutor uh, including of uh, the st- the uh, feeding our future cases very high profile cases did some high profile uh, work as a county prosecutor as well, Marine Corps. Um, you mentioned Harvard Law, so he's got this great resume. Um, but then um, the party is so enthralled to Trump that you can't uh, win the endorsement. You can't get the support of the local activists that you need unless you you endorse Trump. So he does so. And and as I tried to point out in the column. Um, you can't be a law and order guy and then also support Donald Trump. Um, Trump's uh, what, what he has said about the Department of Justice and the FBI, I mean, are, are um, totally beyond the pale. And, and especially for a guy who, who he's, he's he's really criticizing, he's attacking uh, Tayrab's uh, colleagues, his former colleagues, uh, the, the FBI agents who who uh, helped uh, Tayrab. Uh, in his his cases, I mean, they they did the uh, the the uh, investigating to to bring those cases, and and you have, and then he's going to uh, endorse a candidate who uh, has talked about defunding the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, in, until they quote come to their senses unquote. Um, he, he also has this uh, history of of lying and dissembling, um, and, and of course the events of January sixth were sort of the opposite of the rule of law. And, um, and so Tayrab to me is, um, he's, he's really turned his back on, uh, his, his former colleagues and, uh, not just in the department of justice and the FBI, but also the Marine Corps, uh, because the, the documents that Trump stole and, uh, was, uh, that had, had that, uh, his, uh, his club in, in, uh, Florida, um, those were about American military uh, capabilities and vulnerabilities and, and the capabilities and vulnerabilities of America's allies and, uh, and enemies. Um, and so, uh, you know, military folks, including the former de- de- uh, Secretary of Defense for Trump, has said that this could put American uh, service members at risk. So uh, this is the unfortunate place that we're in. 
um, when you have uh, Trump dominating uh, the party uh, still to this day. Well, I like the note you also put in your column, too, where you talked about how when Trump made those comments to House Republicans, basically urging them to defund the Department of Justice and the FBI until they come to their senses. Well, when Trump made those comments, Tarab was working for the Department of Justice at that very moment in prosecuting cases. So as you said in your column, essentially that would be saying, well, Tarab, you can continue working for the DOJ, but don't do it for any pay because, well, House Republicans need to defund the DOJ and FBI until they come to their senses. So, yeah, that's a rather funny aspect as well, because this is a guy who worked for the Department of Justice, and yet, here you go, you have a former president saying, let's defund this entire department. Right. I mean, he wanted uh, the he wanted folks like Joe Tayrab uh, and his colleagues at the DOJ and the FBI agents who assisted in those investigations to, to work without pay. Um, and, and unless uh, the the DOJ would drop its prosecution of him, um, and, and of course it's now in two separate cases, one taking documents that were not his, they were and they were sensitive documents, and he was uh, keeping them in very unsecure locations uh, that were almost certainly um, uh, exposed to foreign intelligence, and then the second case where he refused to leave office despite losing um, and, and cooked up that scheme to try to stay in office and refused to do the tre- peaceful transfer of power. Um, and, and Joe Tayrab's uh, colleagues, former colleagues of the DOJ, I'm sure have been working, um, you know, 16, 18 hour days uh, to try to uh, ensure the rule of law and the safety of the American public and our democracy. And, uh, and so it's, to me, it's, it's, he, he's really, it's insulting to his former colleagues that he would turn around and, and endorse Trump. Again, we're speaking about Joe Tayrob, who is one of the Republican candidates looking to challenge Democrat Angie Craig in the 2nd District. And the reason why we're focusing on him is that, well, the 2nd District, very likely to be Minnesota's most competitive congressional race uh, later this year. So important to talk about the candidates in this race. And of course, it's not a guarantee that Tayrob will be the Republican nominee, as we did point out earlier. He does have another opponent, Taylor Rahm, that is seeking the Republican nomination. But talking about this race, has Tayrob tried to dis? distance himself at all from Trump or some of those extremist positions? I know, granted, it's still very early in the campaign, or has he still largely embraced these types of positions? And has Angie Craig appeared concerned at all about the the campaign for Tarab, or are we still generally pretty early in the cycle for any of those conversations yet? Well, that district is always going to be a kind of very swingy district, and, um, and, and Angie Craig uh, I think she knows that, and um, and she's a very shrewd, careful uh, politician, and has played that district very well. If you remember, she lost in 16, she won in 18, uh, she won a close re-election in 20. She did expand her lead a little bit in 22, uh, but I think that she's certainly not taking that for granted. Republicans are definitely targeting it. Uh, Tayrab, uh, insofar as there is a Republican establishment, he's kind of lined lined them up. Especially, uh, he's got uh, folks associated with. With uh, the uh, minority House Minority Whip Tom Emmer uh, from our own Sixth District, helping him, um, so so definitely it's a, it's it's an in-play district. I think it's probably going to be the closest race uh, in, in Minnesota um, amongst the eight congressional districts. Uh, the the you met you asked about uh, uh, Mr. Tayrab's uh, whether or not he's trying to distance himself from Trump. He was interviewed uh, by Axios, and he kind of refused to say whether or not he would endorse Trump. And um, so that was um, a little odd. And then um, he kind of made this claim uh, that later on at a uh, kind of a uh, campaign event that he he told the ax that he told the reporter to quote unquote pound sand, um, which was not really accurate not portrayal of the conversation from what I understand. Um, and then once he was challenged by his opponent, uh, Mr. Rahm, the defense uh, attorney, uh, then uh, Tayrab turned around and, and endorsed Trump um, as, as they all do in the end, uh, as Trump himself said, they, they all bend the knee as he once said about, about Tom Emmer. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. They always bend the knee, and that uh, appears to be the case with pretty much everyone that's running as a Republican in just about every congressional district around the country. Uh, read more about that column over at minnesotareformer.com, again titled, By Endorsing Trump, Joe Tay Robb Has Turned His Back on His Former DOG Coll- DOJ Colleagues and Marine Corps. Again, find that over at minnesotareformer.com. I want to talk about another story you guys have been working on over there at The Reformer, and this one is from Christopher Ingram, which has to do with the performance of charter schools and public schools in Minnesota. So going to read through some stats briefly. So back in 2023, just last year, obviously, there were 78 public schools in Minnesota where zero students in at least one entire grade level were rated proficient in the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment Tests in Reading or Math. That's according to the Department of Education data that was analyzed by the Minnesota reformer. So again, there were 78 public schools in Minnesota where zero students at at least one entire grade level were rated proficient. Substantively, there was little difference between a school where 0% of 5th graders meet standards and one where 5 to 10% do. That was noted by Christopher. And for comparison, about 50% of all Minnesota public school students rate as proficient at math and reading, and that number has been declining since the onset of the pandemic. And most of the schools with the extremely high failure rates, 59 of those 78 that I was referring to earlier, are public charter schools. So these are some pretty eye-popping numbers. So I'm curious, what kinds of charter schools are these? Because 59 out of 78 of these schools that have students who that rated zero had zero students that were proficient in math or reading is eye-popping. So I'm curious, what kinds of schools are these? Because this is these are shocking stats. Yeah, I mean, so we kind of got this this idea to to find schools that where we have zero percent percent of the kids are proficient, um, and and that we thought that was important uh, reporting to do because uh, well, the, one of the government's primary jobs, especially uh, state and local government, is to to uh, to teach children math and reading to prepare them uh, to be citizens, and um, so we didn't set out. To, to write a charter school story, let me say that. Uh, but then, as we did this reporting, that's that's what we found. We have a, that, as you mentioned, 59 of the 78 schools uh, where we had a a grade level at zero percent proficient uh, were charters, um, and so they include places like Rochester STEM, Skyline Math and Science, Minnesota Excellence and Learning Academy, um, and something that uh, these schools often have in common is that they tend to be highly segregated. Um, so at, at more than half of the charters, uh, fewer than 10% of the students are white, and at more than a quarter, there are no white students at all. Um, and, and so this is, they're also often in, in uh, economically challenged um, zip codes. The reason this matters is because there's a, a debate going on uh, in, in Minnesota about uh, the resegregation of, of our schools. And um, there, there's a, uh, some researchers at the university who think that, that charter schools are at the forefront of, of that school segregation. There's a, uh, there's a lawsuit um, that uh, is seeking to desegregate our schools, at least in the metro. Um, and uh, the, there's three charter schools that have, that have actually uh, joined that um, lawsuit um, on behalf of the, the state, the defendants, um, they, they argue that they're often taking the, the toughest cases and, um, and so they shouldn't be judged uh, harshly um, on the basis of the, these proficiency scores. Um, and um, they point to uh, successes in, in certain high quality uh, charter schools. But I think this is Bit of an eye opener. I hope it is for lawmakers about um, the way that we regulate uh, charter schools and um, and as the birthplace of the charter school movement here in Minnesota. Maybe we do need to be paying closer attention, um, especially to these uh, really uh, these these schools that are really struggling to to offer uh, to, uh, to, for their students to get proficiency uh, in these basic skills. 
No, this is probably a, a larger question than we have time to answer, but what's been happening at these schools where no students are meeting their minimum requirements? Because it seems to be kind of a mixed bag where we have some cases like what's happening with the Dr. Josie R. Johnson Montessori School, which closed because the school was $700,000 in debt and had basically been inflating their enrollment numbers. You have cases like that. But then you have other cases where uh, where Christopher had a chance to speak to a number uh, to a couple of executive directors at local charter schools John Crossan and Darius Hussein who basically suggested that charter schools do face some systemic issues with their students so uh, as you kind of alluded to as well sometimes these charter schools do take on students who may have dropped out of other public schools or have have a history of truancy or come from very economically challenged areas while in other cases we do have charter schools that largely aren't doing their job and uh, have some kind of shady finances going on so it does kind of complicate the picture too as to what's happening with many of these charter schools that are struggling to have any of their students meet those minimum standards yeah chris talked to um a gentleman named Tony Simmons. He's the executive director of the, the high school for recording arts in St. Paul. And he said that uh, most of his students uh, have already dropped out of one or more of the tr- more traditional public schools. And I mean, this is a pretty shocking statistic, anywhere from between 35 and 50% of them lack a permanent residence. So I, I think if you're, if you're talking about this, uh, such a challenge, marginalized student uh, population, um, I think we can understand that they're not necessarily going to be uh, scoring uh, great numbers on the proficiency tests. Um, on the other hand, he gives the example of, of as you mentioned, the, the legacy of Dr. Josie Johnson Montessori School, where uh, they just had this huge amount of debt um, and, and had been misreporting their enrollment figures um, by a lot. And so the state ended up uh, state dollars follow enrollment. So the fact that they had a lower enrollment meant that the state was going to stop paying them for, for students that were not in fact there. And once that happens, um, they, they had to shut down. So, you know, that, that's, that's a situation that where you're dealing with a, uh, looks like financial mismanagement at, at best, malfeasance at worst. Um, and, and so, you know, nobody seemed to be watching closely enough in that situation. Whereas, okay, maybe there's other situations where um, this charter schools are are dealing with a a student population that is extremely challenging, and we might understand that they're not uh, meeting our proficiency benchmarks. Um, But overall, um, I think the state needs to probably pay closer attention. That's that's just my, uh, my two cents here. And final question on this, uh, again, going back to the Cruz-Guzman lawsuit that you were talking about earlier, some of this data does seem to largely support that we've seen in this article that Christopher uh, wrote going through this data of a number of schools that are having zero students that are are reaching those proficiency numbers. It does seem like the data really does support the argument that's being made in the Cruz-Guzman lawsuit that, well, segregation has not been helping Minnesota students. So if the court were to rule in favor of the plaintiffs in this case, would a number of these charter schools be impacted? Would they potentially be impacted if the, if the ruling does go in favor of the plaintiffs in that Cruz Guzman case? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I think what's more likely is some kind of settlement. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, as far as charter schools being eliminated, I don't, I don't see that happening, especially in the settlement talks, especially when you've got these three charter schools that are um, party to the lawsuit. Now, um, but I, I think that um, the the evidence piling up that r- racial segregation is bad for academic outcomes, I, I think it can only um, give uh, significant leverage to the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. So we'll just have to see how um, the, the settlement talks go. And then, of course, any settlement probably is going to have to be approved by the legislature. Um, but, the, you know, I, I it's, it's a good question as to are legislators paying enough attention? Because if this does go to trial and there's some kind of a remedy that uh, the court calls for, um, you know, now, now the legislature is kind of out of their hands. So uh, this is another issue I think that they need to be paying attention to. Um, but it is politically dicey, and so I'm not really sure if they are or not.
I'll encourage you to go check out Christopher's article over at minnesotareformer.com titled In Dozens of Minnesota Schools, Entire Classes Are Failing to Meet Minimum State Standards. I encourage you to check it out because there's lots there we didn't have time to get to. So if you're interested in what's been happening with education in Minnesota and the charter school movement, which largely did begin in this state, uh, make sure you check that out over at minnesotareformer.com. We have been speaking with Patrick Kulikan, who is the editor-in-chief of the Minnesota Reformer, again, at minnesotareformer.com for the latest in Minnesota. Minnesota news and politics. Patrick, thanks so much for coming back on the show today. It's always a pleasure. All right, let's take a break and send things back over to Matt McNeil on AM 950.